so hopefully you guys enjoyed my previous teams guide video but i know it didn't cover everything about kogami so i wasn't necessarily planning on doing faq but there were some interesting questions i received that didn't have long enough answers to warrant dedicated videos by itself but were too interesting for me to just reply with a comment without covering them in a video okay so the first question why does it seem like all versions of triple hydra use nahida wouldn't using a weaker dendro make it easier to make sure that only one unit is triggering the blooms okay so this is the quality versus quantity sort of question when it comes to reactions so this is how i would explain this answer so there are some reaction teams in the game where you want your game plan to be clean and controlled for example only one of your characters is built for damage or has lots of em like for example a hu tao xingqiu vape team if your hu tao is doing lots of vaporizes on most of her hits but say you add xiangling in your team and now many of your hu tao's hits are not vaporizing anymore this can be a damage loss like xingqiu might be getting vaporizes which she isn't built for and you're basically wasting your hu tao's build but the way Nilu teams work is very different than most other reaction teams. This is because depending on what builds you have, it's basically impossible for your teammates to have bad builds. There are so many team buffs in Nilu teams like her talent, maybe if you have a signature weapon, Dendro resonance, maybe you have instructor set. What all these team buffs mean is that even your lowest EM character actually has high EM and reaction damage. And on top of this, Bloom is a reaction that everyone in the team can do since it's just combining Hydra and Dendro. It's not like other reactions where, for example, half your team set up the element for one character to react with. Also, I should add EM as a stat has diminishing returns as you increase the amounts you have. This also means initial amounts of EM you put on your characters gives you quite a lot of return. So overall, how I'd answer this question is you combine the two facts that the whole team is capable of doing reactions and that the whole team has lots of EM. It means in a real simplified way, you just want quantity over quality. Basically, you're better off getting as much bloom reactions as possible than reducing your amount of blooms and just trying to get only the highest hits on one character. Like for example, a low EM character in your team might be getting 24k bloom hits and a built character full EM in your team might be getting 38 or 39,000 blooms. But in reality, in bloom teams, you can be applying so much Hydro and Dendro that you can be getting multiple blooms from different characters at the same time. So I guess just to tie it all back to the question, you probably see a lot of triple hydro teams use Nahida online just because she is the best dendro character and these triple hydro teams have all four teammates doing reactions and there's no reason to overcomplicate it and try worrying about just one character doing reactions so the second question basically asking why isn't kokomi used as a shangling vape driver even though xingqiu is single target focused and shangling can't vape a pyranade on all enemies so the thing is, I would say just because Kokomi is Hydro doesn't automatically mean she should be played with Pyro and Vape. I always think that synergy is first and foremost the most important thing for teammates than the element. I covered these in my recent Kli video, but Child Shangling, Kli Shangling, Raiden Shangling, I would say they all have more synergy together than Kokomi Shangling. So there's some reasons why you don't really see Kokomi Shangling. Number one, she already has a healer and buffer in Bennett and I'm sure you all know already they have very high synergy together which is why you rarely ever see Xiangling played without Bennett. Number two I can think of is that Xingqiu and Child have nukes. Xingqiu with his elemental skill and Child with his elemental burst. They both use Xiangling to forward vape off of her pie application and then and then the second part of your team's strategy is Xiangling using their Hydro application in order for her to vape. These characters and nukes also fully benefit from Bennett. And if we can compare Kokomi, 
she has no nuke in her kit and her damage is also split between attack, HP and even healing bonus scaling. So she doesn't really benefit from Bennett that much. And also because of this, there's also less benefit to having her share reactions with Xiongling. Like how I just said how Xingqiu and Chao flip whoever's doing the reactions. And even Yelan. All of these other Hydro characters, they gain a lot from forward vaping their nukes. Without feeding like you lose out. Another thing I thought about is that Xiongling teams like movement and repositioning yourself and being very flexible overall in the map. She can take advantage of movement due to her snapshotting mechanics like snapshotting Bennett's buffs. This allows her to maintain Paranado's damage as long as you can obviously set up vaporized reactions. So Xing Chao has off-field attacks that can help her be flexible and Chao has his variable skill cooldown meaning you can be flexible with his Hydra application and both of these characters work very well with positioning. Meanwhile, I would say that Kokomi's Jellyfish needs sacrificial fragments to be flexible. We see this in Bloom teams, but if you use sacrificial fragments, without TTDS she loses buffs, or without Prototype Amber or Moonglow, her signature weapon, she loses damage and energy. I think this is one of the reasons why Kokomi is so good in Bloom teams, because Bloom teams actually want elemental mastery, so it has good synergy with sacrificial fragments. Overall, to answer this question, I don't think Kokomi really has much synergy with Xiongling. Really, they prefer to work in separate teams. For example, uh, Bennett Xiongling or Bennett Xiongling Kazuha are very popular Xiongling cores. Just like on the other hand, a Kokomi Kazuha or Kokomi Nahida or even Kokomi Yelan are popular cores for her. And even Xingqiu Yelan Double Hydro, you can see that Double Hydro teams or even the Healer teams in general, most people play them on the different Abyss sides and different teams to their Bennett Xiongling teams. Having said all this, you can play Kokomi Xiongling together if you want. This was just answering the question on why they're not really popular. Next question, this is a good one. How big are the differences in practical clear time in Ayaka Freeze team? with Mona, with and without TTDS versus Kokomi. So I've been speed running with Ayaka ever since she came out, so I think I can answer this question well. And it really depends on the Abyss. Like one of the biggest factors is how many waves of enemies there are and the position of the enemies in the chambers. For example, if I think back, I would say most Abysses in the Inazuma patches, so like 2.0, 0 to 2.8 and even early Sumeru patches like 3.0 and 3.1 even the fastest speed runs we used Kokomi a lot because chambers were shorter and you didn't need to move much and Kokomi's advantage here is that her skill has a fast one second setup meaning your Ayaka can start doing damage very quickly her jellyfish also has a long duration but you can't move it so in a lot of these old abysses, it was either just one set of enemies and it was not multi-wave, or even if it was multi-wave, the new enemies would spawn in the same position as the previous enemies. So you could often just catch the new enemies in your current attack, like your current Ayaka burst, and you don't even need to set up again. Whereas in recent abysses, I think there's been lots of bosses and in the AoE chambers, Enemies have been spawning all over the place and Mona has the advantage for both of these situations in regards to bosses because her power budget is less reliant on freeze. Like as we discussed, one of Kogumi's big advantages is that she has a long freeze duration whereas one of Mona's strengths is her omen buff. So because you can't freeze bosses, this makes Mona lose less damage versus bosses. And then for the multi-wave fights, because Mona has a shorter cooldown on her skill and you can reposition her skill every 12 seconds. It allows you to set up faster again when needing to move around for a new wave of enemies. So overall, this can be why you see Mona a lot these days. But I'll also just throw in a few things that because Kokomi generally has more consistent freeze, a lot of times if your fight has annoying enemies, this can mean Kokomi has less resets in the Abyss, but even then, if you are speedrunning, you'll still be resetting for both. 
you just might have more resetting if you use Mona. But speaking on this clear time topic as a whole, obviously this is very min max. Even in situations where I would say one of these characters is advantaged, it's only going to be by a couple seconds maximum, and that is over across an entire abyss, so all three chambers. So to be honest, you're probably even just saving one second per chamber. So of course, for 99% of players, you won't really care about this. Another question is Nilu, Kokomi, Nahida, Kole, Bloom Team better than Nilu, Xingqiu, Nahida, Yao Yao, Bloom Team? I guess this is a question about Kokomi versus Yao Yao. It's a good question, but to be honest, I think I should keep this answer short since it's very subjective. Honestly, in my opinion, and I think some people agree with it these days, but Yao Yao isn't really that good for Nilu. Or to clarify that, if you want the strongest teams, and it's honestly just quite underwhelming because you can see in Yaya's kit that she is designed to be played with Nilu. She's got this Dendro damage resistance for the Bloom recoil. She's got large healing in her burst, and she has the AOE Dendro application. So she has a lot of things going for her. But I think what Hoyaverse really intended is that she was designed to make Bloom easier and more comfortable to play. At least this is what I'm thinking. Like she was a free four star and she helped needy players who didn't have Kokomi or they didn't want to level Barbara, but they didn't necessarily design her to become the best in slot, if you see what I mean. Otherwise they would have given her some Farizan or Goro level constellations. The other thing is, Yaya was obviously the first Dendro defensive utility character. But then right after her, we got Baiju and Kirara. And what I think those characters do well is just having shields or interrupt resistance. For a lot of players, I think that's just inherently more of an advantage than just pure healing, especially with all these aggressive enemies in the abyss. Your healing could be good, but you could be knocked around all over the place. And then you consider that both Baiju and Kirara have great utility from off field. And overall, I think personally, I prefer those characters over Yaya in Nilu teams. So if that didn't really answer the question, I guess the answer is yes, the Kokomi Kole team is better. But of course, that's how I play the game. Uh, Xingqiu Yaya team are two four stars, you might have gotten them for free and Xing has interrupt resistance and Yaya has some decent healing and danger resistance so you might find that team more comfortable than the Kole team. Next question, this is a good question, is there ever an incentive to run Kokomi over other Hydro options outside of teams like Bloom, Freeze and Mono Hydro? Yeah of course. She might not be the best in slot in many other teams, but she could be competitive or at the very least a decent option. And if you think about it, there's probably many supports or off-field characters who aren't even best in slot anywhere. So I don't think she needs to be the outright best option in lots of teams in order to be useful. I mean, and we see this in usage rate surveys right now. Obviously, I'm not looking at these surveys as tier lists or power level lists or whatever you want, but you can see people are playing her in a lot of different teams and clearing the abyss. So an example of other teams, personally, even though I won't really play her much in a Hyper Bloom team, it's still factual that she's good for healing and AOE Hydro application there. And overall, her team's damage can be pretty close to other strong Hyper Bloom teams. And I'm sure some people would even prefer her healing over just relying on Shinobi's healing or even doing no healer runs with Raiden. Even in these tough events that they sometimes do, like even recently they did this tough event, having a strong healer or shielder like Kokomi or Zhongli can be very useful, especially as you take more damage in these events than you do in normal Abyss runs. Next question is basically asking, what would be a good stat line to hit for hybrid Kokomi? And they've seen my showcases of it, but they're not entirely sure of which thresholds to aim for. So as the comment said, I have shown my builds in previous videos and we even made this soft stat goal infographic. But now that I think about it, I do understand the hybrid build can be confusing, so I should probably clarify this. The thing with hybrid builds is that the actual main stats are very flexible. For example, I personally use HP, Sand, Hydro, Goblet and a Healing Bonus Circlet as you can see. 
but that's also because I got a lot of EM here in this HP stands as you can see. This is just what happened to me. Like if you've got an EM stands with HP substats then use that instead. You also don't need a Hydro Goblet. For me personally I want it to increase Kokomi's raw damage because in these Bloom teams there's no Kozawa so she gets hardly any damage bonus from the team so this cup with this high damage bonus is pretty much a straight multiplier but again you can use a HP or EM goblet and I would probably say that a more popular hybrid setup might be EM EM healing bonus but I would warn you that the issue with this is that all three of these main stats are very rare so you're unlikely to have the best substats whereas HP pieces can be a lot more common than EM and you might run into a situation like myself where you get a lot of EM substats. So having said all this, I would still say overall the soft stat goals infographic is a good threshold, but just make sure that you know it's very flexible. And for example, if you're using an EM signs instead, then add a bit more EM to your total and then minus a bit of total HP in return. Just adjust your expectations based on which pieces you're using. And just remember overall, the overall goal for hybrid is increasing your survivability without sacrificing too much reaction damage. It's supposed to be a versatile build that's easier to play. So if your Kogami's HP is high enough for you and your team's healing is high enough for you, then your build should be good. Hopefully that clarified this for you. Last question is, could you do a comparison between Kokomi and Ayato in the shared team archetypes? Teza, Hyper Bloom version. You hardly ever see them compared and there aren't many Ayato mains making detailed TC or meta discussion videos on him. So lastly, I saw this question, but honestly, because I don't main Ayato or play him a lot, I don't want to comment too much about him. If you've watched my channel for a while, you know I only really make videos on characters I play, which also helps you as the viewer because you can be confident that I know what I'm talking about. So I don't want to comment too much on Ayato, but what I can say is Kokomi has the role compression of being a healer while still having the Hydro AoE. So in a lot of our teams, it can be hard to compare her with Ayato because she might be able to use a teammate that he can't unless you want to play him without a healer. Like for example, you mentioned Taser, and you can see Kogami's strengths in this composition since many common Taser teammates like Fischl, Beidou, Kazuha Sucrose, these are all offensive characters who don't heal. Beidou has a small shield, but we'll ignore that for now. But in comparison, you mentioned Hyper Bloom too. And the thing with Hyper Bloom is Shinobu is one of the key characters in Hyper Bloom but she deals damage and heals at the same time. So in Hyper Rune teams, Kogami's role compression strength can be less useful there. So I know I didn't really answer your question, but hopefully this kind of makes sense. It's just not the easiest thing to compare them like that. Okay, so that's it for the FAQ. Actually, I guess this wasn't really a frequently asked questions, but I did like that these were less popular questions, but still good questions that hopefully I answered well. Let me know if you enjoyed this type of video since I've probably only done a couple FAQ style videos before and I do want to make sure my videos answer whatever questions you guys might have had. Thanks for watching.